Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for today's tutorial. Today's tutorial is on COVID-19 given by Dr. Huck. Um, just a few rules for those of you watching via the Zoom. Any questions or comments for things that are being covered in the moment, just pop them into the chat. Any questions that can wait till the end, just pop them into the Q&A. If you're watching on the Facebook Live, just comment your questions or comments and we'll pass them on to the tutor. Um, we apologise for the slight delay today. Um, but that's all from me and I'll hand over to Dr. Huck now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, my name is Rakib. I'm one of the uh, infection registrars uh, in the Northwest, uh, currently working in Preston. Uh, so this is a COVID-19 uh, lecture. Uh, hopefully it will be interesting uh, and helpful to you. Um, so this, I know uh, many of you are medical students. Um, so there are a couple of bits uh, relating to kind of revision points that hopefully will be helpful in your exams as well. Um, I think for, um, I mean, for any, any year of medical student really, um, if COVID-19 isn't part of your exams already, it certainly soon will be. So hopefully this will be helpful for revision purposes as well at some point. Uh, and for the fifth years who have already done finals, um, this will be helpful hopefully in your kind of postgraduate exams as well. Okay, so this is the first time I've given a, a Zoom lecture. Uh, so please bear with me if any technical difficulties. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can kind of hear me and, and, and see me okay. Um, if anyone's having any issues, um, just put a question on the chat. Okay, so what we're going to cover, so the timeline um, of kind of what's happened with COVID in the last few months. Um, so I'm going to cover kind of the medical aspects, um, not kind of the, the social and economic um, aspects of, of which I'm, I'm sure we're all aware. Um, some basic virology, um, epidemiology of COVID, uh, some clinical features, so what, what to look out for, um, investigations, management of cases. Uh, you may have seen in the news, there was some news about that uh, yesterday. Um, and kind of practical aspects for ward doctors. Uh, this talk was originally given for my own trust, so um, some of the things are kind of um, relating to them. So I think I will just kind of uh, uh, skip past those slides. There is quite a lot to get through, so I'll kind of try and go through it relatively quickly. Okay, so timeline. So this is really the, the main point of this is to kind of show how recent this all is, really. Um, so this was, you know, so the first cluster of cases in Wuhan city, so it was at the end of December last year. Um, and then the, the new virus isolated on the 7th of January. Uh, we, had, we had the first cases outside of China, middle of January. Um, by the end of January, you have the first case in the UK and the WHO declaring a global health emergency. Okay, so February, um, so we only had the disease named in February, so that was only kind of, you know, four months ago. Um, and, uh, and we had kind of initial rollout of PCR testing in the UK in the first 12 labs um, in, in the middle of February. Um, and then in March, uh, we had uh, the clinical case definition being updated to anyone being in hospital, uh, admitted to hospital with a pneumonia. Uh, the pandemic was declared on the 11th of March uh, and lockdown in the UK on the 23rd of March. Okay, so April to June. Um, so not a great deal has changed in that time, kind of clinically. Uh, so the peak of cases was actually in April, so quite a while ago now. Um, in May, uh, smell and taste of service was added to the case definitions. Um, so that was interesting. So that was a kind of result of um, some things that were happening in ENT at the time. And in June, uh, so, so what we've got so far this month, so a uh, change in the WHO recommendation on masks in public places, as you have seen, um, rollout of serological tests in the UK, which I'll come on to later, and the recommendation for, for dexamethasone as a result of the recovery trial yesterday. Okay, so some useful resources um, will be kind of mentioned during the talk as well. So useful online resources. So if you haven't already seen these, these are quite kind of interesting and helpful to look at. Um, so there's like a global operations dashboard, which is updated daily 
uh, which kind of gives you an idea of what's going on uh, globally. This, this was more useful kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, um, but uh, you know, it's still kind of useful to look at in terms of um, the ongoing spread. Similarly, there, there's a dashboard for the UK cases um, on their PHE website. So this is the link to, to go to that. And then there's these things called national weekly COVID-19 surveillance reports at PHE. Um, so those are helpful to look at actually. Um, so one of the things findings from that was that um, a seroprevalence study um, across the country actually, uh, which I'll kind of mention later, um, was part of that report. This is what the global dashboard looks like, if you haven't seen this. Okay, so this is a, a, a bit about virology of, of the, the virus. So, yeah, so we have the name uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, so that's re relevant for kind of developing um, certain drug targets and the pathophysiology. Uh, the receptor is ACE2, um, and that is relevant in terms of the kind of complications that we're seeing and, and why people are getting sick with, uh, with, with COVID-19. So, so I'll, I'll mention that uh, a bit later. Uh, so the virus is highly psychopathic in cell culture. Uh, so that was one of the um, first observations um, during the kind of uh, early stages. Um, suspected bat spillover. Um, intermediate host is uh, we think the pangolin, but it's not being confirmed. This kind of thing is obviously uh, quite difficult to prove causality, uh, but that's kind of the, the suspicion. Um, genetic variation. So, so that's an interesting thing to kind of keep an eye on. Um, so far, it seems that there's, there's nothing kind of clinically relevant. Um, minor genetic variations, as you would expect over time, uh, ongoing data collection. So this is uh, something called the nextstrain.org. Uh, so if you have a look at this website, this is kind of um, quite interesting. So it's just kind of a monitoring system, uh, a worldwide monitoring system of um, genetic variability um, in COVID. Um, so clinically, it hasn't flagged up anything relevant so far, but that's kind of uh, ongoing monitoring. So hundreds of genomes are deposited onto this um, resource every, every day, actually. Okay, so spillover. So yeah, so this uh, pandemic has been predicted for some time. Um, so there's kind of a, a large reservoir of, of uh, viruses similar to SARS-CoV um, in bats. Um, and this has been predicted for, for a while and uh, kind of suggestions about preparedness and so on. Uh, this is a summary about uh, coronavirus species in humans. Um, so obviously most of them cause uh, the common cold and, and, and cause mild infections that we don't worry about. Um, a few of the coronaviruses um, do cause severe disease. So uh, SARS, as we saw um, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, and then we've had uh, MERS outbreaks uh, in the last uh, couple of decades as well. Um, or in the last decade, I should say. Um, and so MERS is kind of more, much more rare, um, uh, much less uh, transmissible, um, but much more severe disease. Okay, so why is it called uh, coronavirus? So it's got a crown-like morphology. Um, so here you can see the electron microscope, microscope images. Uh, viral RNA, so what um, secretions and, and tissues is it found in? Um, so respiratory secretions is, is kind of the most common. Uh, you find it in saliva, feces and blood and uh, conjunctival secretions. You can find it in urine as well, but much less appreciable in, in urine. It's not really thought to um, uh, come out in urine. Okay, so transmission. So Transmission, um, on, ongoing debate about airborne transmission, obviously, which I, I, I'll uh, touch on later on. Um, but the main mechanism of transmission is actually um, probably from fomites uh, rather than even large droplets. Um, so you can get large droplet transmission by you know, coughs and sneezes. Uh, and the range of that 
but well varying really, but um, up to two meters, hence the, hence the two meter social, social distancing rule. Uh, realistically, it's probably significantly less than that. Um, then transfer from uh, fomites by touch. Uh, so that's probably the, the main mechanism by which um, people are, are transmitting uh, virus. Uh, so entry is into host by, by a mucous membrane, so no, nose, mouth, and eyes. There is a low incidence of fecal oral transmission, um, possible airborne transmission. So the, the latest um, WHO uh, guidance and recommendations based on that uh, were based on a couple of studies and there's, um, there's not really any evidence for airborne transmission. Um, there are studies that have kind of simulated um, aerosol generation uh, using kind of machines that do that, um, but they don't really uh, represent kind of actual human con cough conditions. Uh, and so airborne transmission isn't really uh, thought to occur significantly. Okay, so coronaviruses um, survive for quite a long time on different surfaces. Um, so this is the same study as uh, one of the ones that looked at airborne or aerosol uh, persistence. Um, so it looked at kind of um, uh, viral RNA uh, presence after, uh, with time in, on different surfaces. Um, so for cardboard, it's around 24 hours. For plastic and metal, it's up several days. Um, so it does kind of hang around for a while. And that has important implications for infection control, both uh, in the community and in healthcare settings. This is a previous study on other coronaviruses, um, again, showing similar kind of findings and, and showing you how long, um, how, how long you can uh, have virus um, found. Um, can I just check? Um, so if I, I'm not sure, can you guys all still see this whilst this is covered? I'm not sure if it's just a technical point. Okay, good, okay. So, moving on. Okay, so some basic epidemiology. Um, so you've probably all heard of the R0 by now. Uh, so this is kind of a, a representation of how contagious a disease is. Um, so the R0 is the expected number of susceptible hosts infected by a confirmed case. Initially, during an outbreak, it's always high uh, and then kind of slowly falls. And there's a number of reasons for that. So, you know, the development of treatments at some point, um, social distancing measures, as we've seen, um, and the number of susceptible individuals. So, you know, we think that there's going to be a sh at least a short term uh, degree of immunity uh, from having an infection uh, and that will uh, impact the transmissibility of the disease because you have a, a, a smaller pool of people who are susceptible. So the COVID-19 early epidemic R0 uh, in Wuhan city was around 2.5. Um, so the estimates were kind of between two and three. So actually, in terms of transmissibility, that, that's pretty high, actually, in terms of compared to with a few other illnesses. So I'll come on to that. Uh, the serial interval. Um, so that's the time between successive cases becoming, becoming being detected. Um, so that's around uh, six days. So if you have a, a serial interval similar to the incubation period, um, that gives you some idea of whether asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission is likely to be happening. Uh, so I'll come on to asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission a bit later. Uh, the incubation period, so how long um, before uh, somebody has the virus do they display symptoms? And the infectious period, how long from uh, viral entry into the host um, do they become infectious? So as I mentioned, so the R0 of um, SARS-CoV-2 is actually fairly high. Uh, so this is a comparison um, of some other uh, viruses. So, so you can see, so 2.5, um, so fairly high compared with uh, MERS, for example, which is less than one, 
uh, avian flu, which was uh, around 1 to 1 1.5, um, but actually much less than measles, which is probably the most contagious um, virus, of, virus in humans, which uh, the r naught is very high in, in susceptible populations. Incubation period, so around kind of five to six days, uh, but actually quite a, a large range. Uh, so that's clinically quite relevant. So, so one to 14 days is the range. And the infectious period, uh, days from symptom onset, around seven days. Uh, and that uh, has informed kind of the social distancing policy as well. Mortality, well, the initial uh, estimates were kind of, you know, one to 3%. Um, a bit later on when we had more data, um, it changed to around kind of 0.5 to 0.6%, and that's probably around kind of what we're expecting. And that's a mortality in terms of uh, the, the likely uh, mortality in, in the number of cases, uh, not just the ones that we have detected. Okay, so um, duration of infectiousness. Um, so there have been studies on how long uh, someone is infectious, of course. Um, so viral RNA, uh, you can detect for quite a long time after symptom onset. Um, the median is kind of 20 days, uh, the, but the longest is up to kind of five to six weeks after the onset of symptoms that you're detecting viral RNA. And it's longer if you're immunosuppressed. Um, does detecting viral RNA in a, in a swab, for example, um, mean that you're still infectious? Well, the answer is probably not. Um, so you don't necessarily have viable virus being detected. You just have kind of remnants of uh, viral RNA um, after uh, the host has kind of cleared the virus. So the immune uh, system has already uh, dealt with the pathogen, um, but you just have kind of um, genetic material left over, which you're detecting. So the current seven day self-isolation policy from the day of symptom onset, um, it's based on viral detection in cell culture, which is uh, shown to be negative at day eight in a couple of studies. Uh, so I think they, the first one was about uh, three or four months ago now. And this, uh, this idea that um, you have 14 days self-isolation for household contacts. Um, this is to allow time for them, for any household contacts to display symptoms if they're infected. Uh, I'm just seeing, I'm just getting a couple of questions. Um, so what's the difference between incubation period and infectious period? Um, okay, so incubation period is um, the amount of time between uh, contracting the virus, so the you know, viral entry into the host, um, and that host then displaying symptoms. Um, the infectious period is, is kind of the, the period at which, at which they become infectious to other people. So there is a pre-symptomatic phase uh, where you don't yet display symptoms, but you are infectious. Uh, and that's during the incubation period uh, where you're infectious. So the infectious period is the time from contracting the virus uh, to becoming contagious. Uh, so does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, and then we have another question. What's the difference between droplets and airborne transmission? Uh, so droplets um, kind of is, is a larger droplets that don't persist in air. Okay, so they're not kind of inhaled. Well, so, so, they, uh, so they kind of drop under gravity. Whereas airborne transmission, you have particles which are small enough um, to be aerosolized, so they, they uh, they're small enough to be held in the air. And so if the particles are small enough to be aerosolized, so if they're held in the air, then you have airborne transmission by inhalation of infected particles, which are small enough to stay there. That's not really uh, something that, we're, that we think is happening with um, coronavirus, with COVID-19. Um, okay, 
will a test detect if you're in the incubation period or does it detect the infectious period? Um, so if you happen to have a, a test before you display symptoms, then you're likely in the infectious period, okay? Uh, so you're likely, so if you have a, a detectable viral RNA um, before you display symptoms, you probably have a relatively high viral load and, and you will be infectious. You know the R0 for illnesses such as a common cold. Okay. Um, I'm not sure actually about common cold. So in terms of um, transmissibility, uh, there are, uh, I imagine there's quite a number of studies. I, I suspect it's kind of fairly similar to flu um, and, and maybe a bit higher. So maybe kind of um, around two. Um, but I don't actually have any, any evidence to back that up. Okay, so moving on. Um, so pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission. So is this happening and how common is it? Um, so initially we thought it wasn't very common at all. Um, and, and it was a kind of a very minor proportion of transmission. Uh, but now we're kind of starting to realize that quite a lot of transmission is happening before people display symptoms. And that's important. Um, so estimates uh, from a recent study suggested that it was kind of, uh, so you can estimate the amount of pre-symptomatic transmission uh, as a extrapolated by viral loads over time measured in different people and serial intervals. So the amount of time between case A developing symptoms and, and then passing on to case B and case B then developing symptoms. Um, and we found that kind of pre transmission is actually very common. So estimates suggest around actually 40%, which is statistically very high. So 40% of transmission is happening before people develop symptoms. Clearly that has a significant impact on uh, infection control and social distancing policy. Um, variable estimates on the kind of the prevalence of so this is the number of people that currently have virus who aren't yet symptomatic. Um, and actually, even those are all pretty high estimates. Um, so these are all from the last few months. So initial studies were showing kind of, you know, one to 5%, um, but one, one that was up to 30%. Um, so variable, probably not as high as 30% um, in most cases, um, but is still fairly high and reflective of the amount of presymptomatic transmission that's actually happening. Um, and your viral load is highest around the time of onset of your symptoms. Okay, so just looking at questions. So can the incubation period and infective period overlap? Yes, essentially. So um, you might still, so the incubation period is before you have symptoms, um, but you can be infectious during that time, yes. Okay, uh, so preventing transmission. So what are the most effective things? Uh, so the number one most effective way of reducing transmission is hand hygiene. Okay, uh, so as I said, it's mainly kind of fomite transmission. Uh, so you touch a surface which has uh, virus particles and then you touch your mouth, or your nose, or your eye, and, and that's the way most of the virus is being transmitted. Okay, so PPE obviously for the level of exposure uh, in the healthcare settings and infection control measures in those settings as well. Uh, avoiding touching your face and eyes, social distancing, um, and accurate predictions and models of, of transmission, uh, which is the domain of epidemiologists. Okay, so I think we're having lots of questions, which is very nice. Um, I'm just going to move on a little bit more quickly, just because I think, just in terms of time constraints, this might be uh, a little bit rushed. So, um, 
Okay, so how, how do we uh, model the spread of disease? Uh, so fairly complex, as you can imagine, uh, real-time mathematical modeling uh, based on several different models. So there's always kind of several different groups working at the same time uh, to answer the same questions a lot of the time as well. Uh, accuracy increases with data as a pandemic progresses or an epidemic progresses. Uh, and this is kind of how decisions are made in the UK. Um, so you have a, a, a CMO and then you have SAGE uh, and then you have this group called SPY-M who do all the modeling uh, and they include groups from various different centers um, with epidemiologists at each one. Okay, so, um, so infographics I'm not usually like a big fan of, um, but some of them can be kind of quite helpful, especially these ones, so these are taken from Financial Times who produce kind of weekly charts of how, um, how, the, how the pandemic is progressing internationally. So they're quite helpful from an international standpoint. Um, and so this is a nice one looking at um, the, 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 the mortality figures over time uh, in different places. Okay, so risk factors um, for becoming unwell with uh, COVID-19, so age, uh, comorbidity, so cardiovascular comorbidities we're finding is a very common risk factor, um, particularly diabetics. Um, being overweight actually should also be on there. Uh, and for more severe cases, uh, being male is also uh, a risk factor. So this is taken from uh, ICNARC. So ICNARC is um, an intensive care audit research network um, and they produce very good uh, ICU mortality figures and, 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 uh, and they produce regular updates on um, the ICU COVID situation. Uh, so this shows you kind of the age distribution and it shows you that um, uh, males are much more likely to be admitted to ICU. Yeah, so about 70% are male. Okay, uh, so this is kind of, um, this is quite an old study now. So this is one of the early Lancet studies, I think over about a couple of hundred patients um, uh, and looking at various different risk factors uh, and showing kind of uh, the relative uh, risk of each one. I wouldn't pay too much attention to these numbers because they're, they're actually very small. Okay, so how do people become unwell? So pathophysiology. Um, so the main one for kind of certainly for oxygen requirement would be cytopathic effect. Uh, so um, as we've seen in cell cultures, uh, the virus is highly cytopathic. And if that happens in the lungs, uh, you can get um, ARDS. Um, and if you don't progress to that, you, you might have an oxygen requirement or, or need hospital admission. So the breathlessness is probably from direct cytopathic effect. Um, Becoming more unwell than that is partly because of a very severe inflammatory response, so a systemic inflammatory response, um, plus or minus this thing called HLH, uh, which might be part of the uh, pathophysiology, which I'll come on to. And then we're also seeing that um, people with COVID have a really severe hypercoagul hypercoagulable state, uh, plus or minus uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So, um, so PEs and, and, and VTs are actually uh, fairly common. Um, I'm not sure if we have kind of accurate figures on this. Um, and, a, and a lot of it is actually probably microthrombi. So people getting really sick because of um, systemic microthrombi and pulmonary microthrombi rather than acute uh, pulmonary embolus um, kind of localized in a, in a large vessel. Um, so stages of illness, um, so this might inform when to, to give different treatments. Um, so you initially have an innate immune response where you have quite mild symptoms, and then you have an adaptive immune response where, where you have a quite, quite, quite a severe systemic response, systemic inflammatory response. Okay, so this means that people get sick from around the second week of symptoms onwards. So, um, so what you find is that you know, somebody 
has an incubation period of around kind of five or six days um, after they have uh, contracted the virus. Then they become symptomatic and they're kind of relatively well for the first few days. They might be admitted to hospital and they might need oxygen towards the end of the first week or in the first few days. Um, and then in the second week of symptoms onwards, uh, they become very unwell and, and they, that, that's the point at which they start needing kind of respiratory support, uh, pressure support and, and ventilation. So this has, a, has an impact on how we might go about managing these patients. So uh, there's an argument that early intervention um, may be more effective than waiting until patients get very unwell, um, but there's no evidence to, to, to say that that's helpful so far. Um, and, and patients that are relatively well who admitted to hospital, then they go home, um, safety netting is key. So, so you need to inform them that they might become more unwell uh, several days later and have a low threshold for calling for help um, if, they feel, if they're feeling more unwell. So when I say second week onwards, um, there's quite a lot of variability, similarly to what we're seeing with the range of incubation periods. Um, uh, patients get, uh, there's kind of a range of, 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 of how soon they become unwell, particularly in younger patients who, who usually get more unwell uh, slightly earlier. Okay, so inflammatory response. So there's various kind of inflammatory cytokines which are involved in their systemic inflammatory response. Um, IL-6 is particularly implicated uh, and one of the monoclonals, which is an anti-IL-6 antibody is currently under uh, various clinical trials. Um, and this thing called HLH, um, so that's something called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Um, we don't really understand a great deal about it, um, but it's kind of a form of a really severe in, uh, systemic inflammatory response um, where you get um, a very high ferritin. I'm not quite sure on the pathophysiology of that. It's actually probably rarer than we initially thought. I think so this is one of the early theories of why people get so sick with, uh, with COVID, um, but it's probably more actually about um, uh, microthrombi is, is the current theory. Okay, so in terms of clinical features, um, so this was, um, so this is kind of a synthesis of a few of the earlier studies. Um, so the main things to take away is that fever is very common, uh, cough is very common, and actually more common than breathlessness, particularly early on. Um, and then uh, you can get GI symptoms as well. Um, so have some idea, so um, keep it in the back of your mind that actually someone who comes in with fever and GI symptoms, uh, in the absence of any respiratory symptoms is unlikely to be COVID, um, but it's something to think about. Okay, so um, there was a question about cytopathic effect. Uh, so cytopathic just means it, 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 it kills cells. So that, that's all it means. Um, so yeah, so exactly as someone has said, so it's, it's caused by direct cell damage, so it's damage caused by the virus um, as it uh, replicates and destroys the cell it's currently infecting and moves on to, to, to the next cells, the adjacent cells. Okay, so clinical features. So what are we looking for clinically? Uh, so as I said, fever, cough, and breathlessness are the most prominent and part of the case definition. However, the absence of fever does not exclude COVID-19, uh, and that's important. Um, so, uh, you know, so if someone comes in with a persistent cough or has a persistent cough, particularly in the community, they don't necessarily have a temperature, um, that still may well be COVID-19. Um, smell and taste disturbance are now part of the case definition. Uh, so that only happened, uh, I think, in May, from my, from my remember. So, uh, so that actually is actually more uh, sensitive and specific for COVID than initially uh, thought. It wasn't really part of the initial discussions, and, and now we're finding that actually it's very common. 
Uh, I'm not sure I have any figures on that. Um, if anyone has any, please feel free to put in the chat. Um, Non-specific viral symptoms at admission uh, are helpful. Uh, so do ask about uh, these things specifically when you're admitting a patient. Um, and GI symptoms may actually precede respiratory symptoms, and that has some implications for infection control. So this is the current uh, case definition uh, for hospital inpatients uh, or being admitted to hospital uh, from the PHE website. So as you can see, anyone needing admission to hospital who have pneumonia or ARDS or a flu-like illness or a loss of change in, uh, uh, or change in uh, taste and smell. Okay, and then in uh, the outpatient setting or in the community, uh, anyone with a continuous cough, a uh, high temperature or uh, an anosmia or loss of taste. Okay, so in terms of, so this is just kind of a, a timeline of um, the symptoms and, and how they progress. Um, so I'm not quite sure that you have admission before you develop, or after you develop breathlessness. Uh, so sometimes that's the other way around. Uh, and this is a synthesis of, kind of some of the early studies. I think the total number of patients that these studies were looking at was about kind of 700. Um, that gives you some idea of how soon uh, someone becomes unwell. Uh, so they have symptoms and then they're admitted after, well, probably actually earlier than that. Um, and they're breathless around the same time. And then they become very unwell at kind of day 10 of symptoms. The cause of deterioration in ICU or kind of complications of COVID. Uh, so hypercoagulable hyper state, uh, as I mentioned, so you can get uh, DIC um, and you can get PE and DVT, um, but more mostly PE. Uh, myocardial injury, so we're seeing quite a lot of people who have a, a very high troponin, um, and that's probably because of the amount of uh, ACE2 in the, in the cardiovascular system. Uh, a lot of people getting AKIs. Uh, and obviously you can get secondary bacterial infections similar to what you see in other uh, viral pneumonias. Okay, so this is just uh, kind of a, a graphical representation of what you see with the, this coagulable state um, that I've mentioned. So, so you can see that actually uh, D-dimers seem to be a fairly strong predictor of mortality. Um, and so this then raises the question of whether treatment of DIC um, or kind of prophylactic higher dose uh, low molecular weight heparins uh, might be important. Uh, so the BTS have released some guidance on this. Uh, so have a look at this, it's quite useful to look at. Um, they do suggest using a, a higher dose of um, VT prophylaxis in some cases. Um, but generally it's kind of the, the same prophylactic dose. Uh, the other kind of main take home message from this was that if you have someone who is very, very unwell with a possible P, uh, you don't wait for a scan, you give them, thromb um, you thrombolize them uh, before you have a scan confirming a P if there's a high enough clinical suspicion and the patient is sufficiently unwell. Okay, so co-infection and secondary infection. Uh, so Co-infection with other viruses can occur, probably a small proportion of cases. It's not really clear if detection of viral genetic material of these other viruses represents real active infection. Um, bacterial and secondary infection can occur. Uh, there's no clear preponderance so far of any particular bacterial organism. Uh, so it's similar to what you see across the board in community acquired pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonias. Um, you'd have a low threshold for empirical antibiotics uh, for unwell patients. Um, continue to send relevant samples for microbiology. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, and I think a lot of us underestimate the, the usefulness of a sputum sample. Uh, so please, if you, if you have a patient who is bringing up sputum, uh, please do send that to the lab for, uh, for culture. <clears throat> 
um, a procalcitonin. So this is um, uh, an inflammatory marker. So um, it's uh, purported as something that's more uh, specific for bacterial infection. It's being used in some centers and may have a role in uh, antibiotic stewardship. Investigations. So, um, so I'll come on to each of these uh, in turn. Um, essentially, there's no current gold standard of uh, investigation. So um, sensitivity and specificity estimates are based on kind of a uh, overall combination of, of all of these things, really. Um, yeah, and so this as yet unknown prevalence, we probably actually do know the prevalence at this point, which I'll, I'll come on to later. Okay, um, so biochemistry and hematology, so what do you see on basic investigations in blood? So lymphopenia is quite common, uh, and the degree of lymphopenia may predict disease severity. Uh, Y-cell count and platelet count are often uh, low normal. Um, platelet counts can be uh, fairly low, actually. Uh, CRP is usually not very high, so kind of around 50 to 60 in patients who are not very unwell. Um, Anecdotally, so I haven't seen any uh, studies backing this up, but actually one of the things that we're seeing is um, you have a CRP that's persistently then quite high in patients who are in patients who, are, who stay in hospital. Uh, so you can have a CRP that's kind of 100 to 200 that goes on for a week or 10 days. Um, so CRP sometimes is not that helpful and, and that's where procalcitonin is starting to come in. Um, so Procalcitonin is usually not raised, so um, the cutoff would be less than 0.25. Um, monitoring of D-dimers may have a role, um, doesn't have a clear recommendation yet, um, but may come in at some point. Um, the negative predictive value of all of these things is, is obviously poor, so these are all kind of basic lab investigations. So if you don't have any single one of these, that, that obviously doesn't rule out uh, COVID-19. And uh, consider HLH if you have a, a very high ferritin and a very unwell patient. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so this is just a, a table kind of um, explaining that. Uh, so, this, again, a synthesis of a few of the earlier studies of, of population uh, with COVID 19. Okay, so this is. Um, uh, a table showing actually that the CT scanning. So, so chest CTs are more sensitive, um, certainly than upper respiratory tract uh, PCR testing. So sending a nose and throat swab is less sensitive uh, than a CT. It depends somewhat on how on the timing of these tests. So um, uh, by the time you have kind of lower respiratory tract symptoms and severe pneumonia, CTs will be more sensitive. Uh, than upper respiratory tract uh, swabs. Um, the other problem of um, the nose and throat swabs is um, observer variability, uh, tester variability. Um, so it really depends on the kind of the technique of uh, the person doing the test. So sensitivity uh, of, uh, of the PCR testing from an upper respiratory tract sample, probably around kind of 65 to 70 percent. Uh, whereas CT, uh, I'm not sure about this kind of 98%, probably more like 80 to 90%, um, but, but certainly higher than the PCR. Okay, uh, so PCR testing. Um, so we do nose and throat swabs. These underperform if they're not uh, sufficiently deep into the nose um, and throat. Um, and if, uh, if you have a patient who's had symptoms for a bit longer, uh, then a lower respiratory tract sample then is more sensitive than upper respiratory tract, and that's important. So if you have a patient who, for example, uh, has a negative initial uh, nose and throat swab, uh, you might be better off a couple of days later when you're considering retesting that patient uh, to send a sputum if, if that's possible to send. Okay, so uh, sensitivity of PCR around 70%, as we mentioned, a single negative test does not exclude infection, uh, and you, if, unless there's a, a clear 
alternative diagnosis, um, then you should be keeping that patient cohorted in a suspected COVID bay or side room uh, until you have a repeat test. Um, and bronchoalveolar lavage is currently not recommended because of the high transmission risk of, uh, of doing this procedure. Okay, so, uh, so a few more questions. Um, how does something become listed as a risk factor? Um, so that basically, um, you can just see uh, the proportion of people who are more unwell or, or, or who die from, uh, from a disease who have that particular risk factor. So the way to do it would be a case control study, which uh, has the most kind of, uh, so that's the best way we can work out whether something, whether there's a causal link. So for example, um, with uh, Zika virus and microcephaly, um, the most reliable way of working out whether the virus is causing microcephaly was a case control study. Um, how big does the viral load have to be to test positive on nasal swabs? Um, I don't know the answer in terms of what the viral load has to be actually. Uh, I'm sure our virologists would, would know and I can try and find out. Um, and then can you, can you test positive early on in the incubation period? Well, yes. So, um, so yes, you can uh, have a positive test um, before you display symptoms. Uh, what number is high temperature? So the case definition is using a temperature of more than 37.8. Um, some people say that uh, viral uh, infections tend to cause very high temperatures, um, but that's not really a reliable finding. Um, and so, you know, 37.8 is the cutoff year we're using to maximize sensitivity uh, so that we don't miss uh, patients who don't have particularly high temperatures. Do ARBs in interfere with COVID? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, should patients continue taking ARBs? Uh, so, so there isn't any um, solid evidence on this. Uh, I, don't, I think the current recommendation um, is that they, they, that they don't stop it, um, but it obviously depends on the patient and it depends on um, uh, their likelihood of kind of um, you know, developing uncontrolled high blood pressure or stroke or something. Are platelets acute phase proteins? Um, so they, they do go up in a similar way to acute phase proteins uh, a lot of the time in infections, um, but they don't always, and that actually they can go they can go down with acute infections. Um, and it, why would they be low normal? Well, so they're low in COVID because of this um, this phenomenon where you're having systemic uh, thrombosis, uh, so you're just using up your platelets. Uh, why is low, white cell count low when it's an infection? Um, that's a good question. So it's partly, uh, so it, it depends on the case really. So um, in some cases that will be a degree of myelosuppression caused by an infection. So that's one of the things that can, can happen with systemic infections in general. Um, in some cases there are uh, toxin production. Uh, there's toxins that which are produced that actually kill white cells. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure um, uh, if that's kind of how common that is really. Um, but yes, you do see uh, low white cell counts with, um, with sepsis or, or with some systemic infection. Um, yeah, so pediatrics I'll come on to later. Okay, so moving on, I'll just see what the time is. Oh dear. So. <laughs> Uh, so it's already five o'clock. Um, I'm just going to uh, uh, check what we can do in terms of time. Uh, so I'm going to carry on for now and then just try and get through the, the slides as quickly as possible. Um, and if we're out of time, please feel free to leave or um, uh, to stop me uh, wherever I get to. Okay, uh, so molecular testing, um, 
So PCR test uh, has been rapidly expended in terms of capacity, um, but there are ongoing shortages of equipment and lab staff, uh, which is likely to kind of be made worse by the reintroduction of elective work in the next few weeks. Um, but it is something that's kind of being worked on continuously. Uh, there are several different PCR tests in the UK based on availability. Um, so that's just something to be aware of that, um, that, that might affect reliability of, of testing. Uh, radiology, so absence of radiologic features does not exclude disease, it's probably uh, one of the main take home messages. Uh, there is a temporal progression of the changes and the timing of imaging in relation to symptom onset affects the sensitivity of your tests. Um, test x-ray change is most extensive 10 to 12 days from symptom onset, um, so probably a bit later than you would think. Actually. And CT most sensitive around six days from symptom onset, um, and the changes on CT may be seen before um, PCR uh, with upper respiratory tract sample becomes positive. Um, that, but that was a small study, and I'm not overly convinced about that, um, just because of the nature of how a virus would, would then progress from the upper to the lower respiratory tract. Um, chest x-ray, so baseline admission chest x-ray sensitivity is uh, supposedly higher than you might think, so around 70%. Um, consolidation or this thing called ground glass shadowing um, is uh, a common finding. Uh, in COVID, it's more likely to be bilateral um, and it's more likely that you have peripheral changes so towards the edges of the lung fields. Um, lower zone changes are also uh, much more common than any upper zone features. Thorough effusion is uncommon, uh, and cavitation and lymphadenopathy are not uh, found, and, and these suggest an alternative diagnosis. Okay, so this is a, an example chest x ray. Um, so, yeah, you can see kind of um, a bilateral uh, airspace shadowing here uh, and here, and it's kind of quite diffuse. Um, and probably more slightly more prominent on the, the lower zone, probably not the best example, uh, chest x-ray actually. Um, but there are lots uh, more chest x-rays on this uh, resource, which was quite a good one, um, but there are several um, kind of um, resource banks for, for x-rays and imaging. Okay. Uh, consolidation, so, so for um, so for the medical students, so, um, so what is consolidation? So it occurs when the alveolar airspace is filled with fluid. So that's any, any fluid. Uh, so that can be a transudate, so kind of you know, water or blood or pus. Um, and probably these different causes all look a bit different on, on imaging, actually. Um, but the, in general, the, the features of consolidation would be these. So you have heterogeneous shadowing. So that means it's not all the same shade of white uh, on the x-ray. You have air bronchograms. So uh, because it's a, a phenomenon where you have the, the small air spaces filled up, uh, the larger airways through those, uh, you can still see on the, on the x-ray. Um, for bacterial cause of consolidation, um, likely to be localized with a well demarcated border. And it's airspace rather than interstitial shadowing. Um, the best kind of imaging description of that um, would probably be kind of what, what some people call cotton wool or fluffy kind of shadowing rather than the linear uh, shadowing that you see with uh, interstitial lung disease. From this cause is, of course, pneumonia. Um, there are lots of other causes. So uh, pulmonary edema actually would be coming under the umbrella of consolidation. Um, so it would technically be consolidation on a chest x-ray, it's just a, it looks different to, to infective consolidation, um, malignancy, um, various other less common causes. Uh, this is a, a classic example of a low bar consolidation. Uh, so you, what you see here is you have, uh, so this is right upper lobe consolidation. Um, so you can see the horizontal fissure, you can see consolidation above uh, the horizontal fissure. Um, and it's kind of well demarcated because of the fissure uh, and, and kind of probably interlobular fissures as well here. Um, 
and then you can kind of see some air bronchogram so these may not always be kind of um, side on so some of these kind of small gray dots here probably end on airways that are air bronchograms Uh, so there was a question, would you advise on taking aspirin after developing COVID-19 symptoms? Um, there's, so there's no evidence to suggest that aspirin is, is helpful. Um, there was a thing about NSAIDs, which I'll come on to a bit later. Okay, so floral effusions. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the main thing to, to know is, you know, is it a transidate or an antidate? And then you try and work out a cause. Um, which then uh, which then determines how you manage the, the effusion. Obviously, for any large effusion of any cause where it's causing respiratory compromise acutely, uh, that requires drainage. Uh, so transitive causes, so heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure, um, pericardial disease and PE are, are the common causes. Uh, so they all uh, affect um, hydrostatic and or oncotic pressures. Um, and exudative causes, so infection, so paraneumonic effusions are exudative largely. So they're, they're not always, but they're mostly exudative. Uh, malignant exudates, uh, uh, another common cause of uh, effusions, uh, connective tissue diseases, and a few other less common things. Uh, so that's not an exhaustive list, and there are lots of other causes, um, but in terms of, um, uh, so for medical students, that, that's probably a reasonable list um, to be going on with. Um, so diagnostic aspirate samples, so when you're uh, trying to work out if it's a transidate or an antidate, um, you send fluid for biochemistry, and this is light criteria where if you're not sure if it's a, um, a transidate or an antidate based on just the protein count alone, and then you apply light criteria. This is a revision of light criteria here. Um, you also send fluid for uh, culture, to microbiology, and to uh, histopathology for uh, cytology. Okay, so um, so so CT chest um, for COVID. So again, bilateral and ground glass shadowing is probably more common than consolidation, uh, but consolidation does happen more uh, if you're in intensive care. Uh, generally, the most extensive change is at 10 to 14 days. Um, but the sensitivity is actually higher a bit earlier than that um, and resolution from uh, about two weeks onwards and can be uh, going and take quite a long time to resolve. Um, in practice, if you have a confirmed diagnosis, it's probably not uh, really going to add much to a chest x-ray. Uh, but if you have a negative swab and a high suspicion of disease um, and the patient isn't bringing up any sputum, um, it might be a way to get uh, a COVID diagnosis. So you can uh, have, a, uh, have a diagnosis made of a kind of constellation of symptoms and, and, and a CT. Uh, and these are some of the images that you might see. Uh, so this is kind of some early localized ground glass change here. Um, this is kind of uh, bilateral, uh, how they describe this. Um, yeah, so again, it's mostly ground glass change probably a bit of consolidation. Um, and then here, so you have, yeah, so this is more kind of dense um, with some air bronchograms running through. So this is more like uh, fairly dense consolidation. Uh, and here is kind of, uh, that looks like pleural thickening. Um, so yeah, so kind of a, a variety of um, CT findings. Okay, uh, and again, just uh, some more images on the CT. Okay, so serology. So, so this is relatively recent, um, mostly in the last few weeks that this has been rolled out. Um, so serological tests. So you have an antibody response uh, to any pathogen eventually. So it usually takes a couple of weeks um, to develop initially an IgM, which is an acute um, antibody response, and then IgG, which is kind of a longer term uh, which is developed, uh, and that indicates previous infection rather than uh, current or recent. Um, the current serological tests 
incorporate both IgM and IgG in one test. Um, so that's probably useful to know, and that's to maximize sensitivity. Uh, so if you're just testing IgG alone, then you probably miss uh, quite a lot of people who have IgM and, and vice versa. Um, although if you have uh, IgM, uh, no, so no, no, sorry, that was correct. Um, okay, so in terms of how reliable is the serological test, so PHE have produced a, kind of a report evaluating the test. Um, so for the one we use at, at MyTrust, uh, the overall sensitivity was 84%. Um, and, and at 21 days was a bit higher, so 87%. Uh, whereas the manufacturer had reported a higher sensitivity than that, something that you'll find commonly. Okay, so clinical management. Um, so we have now the first uh, the first drug that's been shown to have a mortality benefit. So dexamethasone. So that was um, a recommendation as of yesterday, um, as a result of some early findings from the recovery trial, which is looking at various uh, drug options. I'll come on to that. Um, potential treatment options under review. Uh, so immune modulating agents and drugs with antiviral activity. Uh, other principles of clinical management are important, obviously infection control. Um, a lot of these patients are very frail uh, and the frailty score is a very useful thing to do in terms of determining uh, what is appropriate uh, in terms of escalation plans for that patient. Um, and that's something that takes a little bit of experience um, to, to kind of but um, it's a really important part of what we do in medicine. Okay, um, so we're at 10 past five. Uh, so I think we, I'll try and get through everything in about another 20 minutes. Um, so that's, uh, that's the plan. Okay, so dexamethasone. Uh, so the dose would be six milligrams per kilo per day for 10 days. Um, that's roughly uh, uh, so roughly uh, 40 milligrams of prednisolone, and you can give it IV or oral. It's uh, more or less equivalent. Um, mortality rate ratios. Uh, so in ventilated patients, it has a higher benefit. Uh, so about a third of patients, um, a third less patients die uh, on dexamethasone. Um, about 20% fewer patients uh, die on, who are on oxygen on, on dexamethasone. There's no benefit if you're not uh, requiring respiratory support. Okay, so supportive management. So, uh, ah, so this, this hasn't been updated, apologies for that. So we should now be giving uh, dexamethasone. Um, the earlier thinking was that there's no clear benefit and that these drugs have uh, a lot of side effects. Um, for unwell patients, early intubation is still important. Um, ICU admission is considered actually pretty early, um, earlier than kind of you see with bacterial pneumonias or other causes of pneumonia. So if you're uh, on an oxygen requirement of 60% or higher, uh, you're likely to be admitted to ICU. A lot of trusts have actually now reduced that to 40% oxygen or higher. Uh, where you're considered for ICU admission and you're on the ICU radar. So, so early ICU admission um, is important if you're on oxygen and, and not, not necessarily large amounts of oxygen, similarly to what you see um, with, with asthmatics, uh, with severe asthma. Um, BiPAP is not recommended, I'll come on to that. Um, don't give people too much fluids, I'll come on to that. Um, Repeat testing for negative PCR, so as I've mentioned. Um, yeah, so this thing about ibuprofen and NSAIDs. Um, so there was a recent controversy with, with French authorities advising avoidance based on a, on a small uh, study, uh, a small observational study, which was fairly poorly designed. So, um, and then lots of people were then thinking about whether NSAIDs were safe uh, there is no evidence that NSAIDs worsen or increase risk of infection. Um, uh, NICE and MHRA are still reviewing the evidence. Um, 
the current advice from KHG would be that you still avoid NSAIDs if you can uh, because of the side effects of these drugs, particularly because we know that uh, COVID can cause AKIs. Okay, so immune modulating agents, so there are lots on here and, and there's probably many more uh, currently being tested um, since this was last updated in April. Um, uh, but this is an idea just to give you a, an idea of, of what uh, agents are around. And a lot of these are, are being tested in the UK now as well, I think. Uh, antiviral, so again, uh, lots of different antivirals being tested and I'm not going to go into the detail of these. Uh, large scale clinical trials in the UK, so the, the complete list is on the NIHR website. Uh, so it's nice to kind of see what's, what's going on with, with COVID at the moment. Uh, and some of these trials will be releasing early results, um, particularly the larger ones, um, as we've seen with the recovery trial. Um, so at my trust, these are the ones that we currently have uh, ongoing recruitment for. Okay, uh, respiratory support. Um, so if you're needing more than oxygen, what's, what's the best way to manage in terms of respiratory support? Um, so it kind of, so this is because um, COVID tends to call atelectasis, which is collapse of small airways. So collapse of the alveoli um, or you know, filling with fluid or consolidation. Um, and that's more of a problem than lung compliance. So lung compliance is kind of a measure of elasticity of the lungs. Um, and if you have a problem with, with the lungs being stiff, uh, you then are more likely to develop type two respiratory failure. If you have a problem where the smaller airways have collapsed down, um, it, it's very different to having stiff lungs where, you, uh, where you're having a problem with ventilation. And so continuous positive pressure is much more uh, beneficial than um, uh, by level positive pressure uh, because the main issue is oxygenation rather than clearing CO2. Um, it would require a separate lecture on respiratory physiology to explain that properly. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, but CPAP is, is, is much more beneficial than, than BiPAP, is I guess the take home message. Um, and proning is also uh, helpful. So either awake proning. Uh, and so that is a, a technique that we are now seeing in patients or uh, ventilators where you, you classically see patients being proned. And that's because you re-recruit lung, uh, which has been filled with fluid or is collapsed down. Um, early intubation is key, especially if you have type 2 respiratory failure or significant hypoxia. Um, respiratory failure, so just a, a revision point on respiratory failure. So carbon dioxide diffusers, out of capillaries more than readily than oxygen diffusion in. Um, this is a, a, a link where you can get a bit more of an idea about um, gas exchange uh, and respiratory physiology. Uh, type one respiratory failure is a type of failure of oxygenation. Um, so you have a low uh, PO2 uh, and a usually uh, normal CO2 or a low uh, CO2 because you're breathing more quickly. Uh, to get in more oxygen and you're breathing out more CO2. Um, and so you might have a respiratory alkalosis in, in uh, type one respiratory failure, but the main thing is you have a low oxygen. Type two respiratory failure is you have a failure of both oxygenation and the removal of CO2 um, because you're struggling to ventilate or the lungs are sufficiently bad that, you're, that, that the diffusion of CO2 has also been affected. Um, so, if you, so what you then have is a, a low oxygen and a high carbon dioxide pressure. Um, and because you have a high PCO2, uh, it makes the blood more acidic. Um, and so you then have a respiratory acidosis. Um, so not quite enough time to kind of go through examples of that, um, but that's kind of a quick revision on respiratory failure. Uh, fluid management. Um, so we're finding out more and more about how dangerous fluids are. Uh, so it's beyond the scope of this uh, talk to kind of go into that further. Um, if you want to know more about that, here's a nice um, summary about it uh, in something called the Internet Book of Critical Care, which is actually quite a nice resource and has a, has a nice chapter on COVID as well. 
Um, severity of illness and prognosis. So 80% um, of people have mild symptoms. Around 15% require hospital admission. Of those, uh, 10 to 20% will need ICU admission. Um, the ICU mortality figures are, are quite uh, high, actually. I'll, 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 I've got a slide on that a bit later. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is survival in ICU. Um, so actually, of those admitted to the ICU, to intensive care in the UK with COVID, since the pandemic started, um, the mortality in ICU is, is around 40%, which is, uh, I guess, pretty, pretty grim reading, really. Okay, so again, more data from the ICNARC audits. Um, so this is the, the, uh, the amount of time people are spending on various types of uh, organ support. Um, so uh, median duration on a, on a ventilator, around kind of two weeks. Infection in children, so this is uncommon, uh, generally mild symptoms, um, possibly a small number of asymptomatic cases. Um, and then children would still be involved in transmission. So, um, so that has been an important um, determinant of policy in terms of when schools are being shut and, and, and reopening. Uh, there are guidelines on the Royal College of Pediatrics uh, now. Uh, response, so this is just some practical things that we've done in our trust. Um, so if you don't have an app in your trust, that's, that's something that uh, might be you can feed back. Um, cohorting, so that's a cornerstone of infection control. Um, so generally most hospitals will have an area where you have confirmed patients who, who are positive, um, separated away from uh, patients who are not suspected to have COVID uh, and the ones who are suspected to have COVID. Okay, in some, in some places, trust antibiotic guidelines will have changed. Um, so for example, some of our three time a day antibiotics have been changed to once daily options. Uh, to minimize uh, contact time to reduce the spread of, of uh, virus within the hospital. Um, so nosocomial uh, COVID transmission is becoming kind of a, uh, one of the major ways in which the virus is transmitted in general. Um, and so we should be minimizing that as much as possible. Um, yep, so these are some trust specific things. Uh, so I'm going to skip over these. Uh, infection control principles. Um, so isolation and cohorting. Um, PPE is important uh, and the single negative we've discussed. Uh, so there's a question about uh, asymptomatic carriers being uh, more likely to be female. I haven't seen any evidence to that effect. Um, if somebody is asymptomatic, how long are they infectious for? I don't think we have much data purely because those people are asymptomatic and less likely to have been tested. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a summary of PPE use, uh, which is available on the PHE website. Um, so if you were going into um, patient care areas, uh, it tells you what uh, PPE where exactly. There are guys on how to uh, how to don and doff uh, PPE and in what order, and, and that's really key in terms of minimising transmission risk as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then, so there's various organisations uh, reviewing uh, PPE and, and what to do if there are shortages. Um, this is a list of aerosol generating procedures. Um, so, I, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about airborne transmission, um, uh, you can have uh, aerosol generation. Um, in, in normal conditions, under coughing and sneezing, that's probably very low. Uh, and so, it's not an airborne phenomenon. Um, but there are certain things which do generate aerosols um, with, with certain procedures with patients. Um, so those things would be NIV and CPAP, high flow nasal oxygen as well. Intubation is a, is a big one. Um, any induced sputum or bronchoscopy. Uh, and then you have a few others which are, are less common here. Uh, so intubation is, is quite a big one in terms of 
um, risk in surgery, uh, and that's been something that uh, we've had to deal with quite carefully. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's a practical thing. Yeah, so what else can you do um, outside of the hospital? Um, teach people a correct hand washing technique, um, advocate maintenance of correct uh, social distancing. Um, so we'll probably see a reduction in the two meter rule um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, stethoscopes. Um, so this is quite, quite an important one actually, and probably one that a lot of places aren't looking at or considering. Um, so as we saw, the virus survives for a long period of time uh, on different surfaces, including uh, plastic and, and rubber and, and silicon. So, so cleaning your stethoscope between patients is actually really important. Uh, you can clean using alcohol wipes. Uh, so 70% alcohol wipes, otherwise you might uh, damage your stethoscope. Okay, so more online resources. Uh, so I've mentioned most of these already. Um, this is a nice book about epidemiology. Uh, any questions, please feel free to, to contact myself. Uh, and these are all the references. Okay, so I think that's the end of the talk. Um, so I'm just seeing if there's any other questions. NG or RALS tube, okay, yeah. So there has been some discussion about that uh, in terms of whether it's an aerosol generating procedure. Um, as far as I know, it's not. Uh, the last time I checked, it wasn't on the list of aerosol generating procedures um, because it, I mean, practically it, it doesn't really involve um, anything where you're manipulating the airway per se. Uh, so yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's not uh, thought to be uh, uh, aerosol generating, um, but I, I would have to check that. Um, will you still be redeployed? Uh, so someone asking on orthopedics. Um, so if you're, on a, if you're due to start an orthopedic rotation, um, are you likely to be redeployed to surgery where they'll have a higher workload? Um, I think that will be dependent on your trust, uh, and I imagine different trusts will be doing different things. Yeah. Okay, uh, so didn't finish too late. Uh, so I'm sorry that went on uh, a little bit, uh, well, a lot longer than planned, uh, and we started a bit late. Um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, then please let me know or uh, feel free to contact me as well. Okay, otherwise, uh, I think that's it, yeah.